Today's scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 20 through 28 from the Common English Bible. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus along with her sons. Bowing before him, she asked a favor of him. What do you want? He asked. She responded, say that these two sons of mine will sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your kingdom. Jesus replied, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? They said to him, we can. He said to them, you will drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left hand isn't mine to give. It belongs to those for whom my father prepared it. Now when the other ten disciples heard about this, they became angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them over and said, You know that those who rule the Gentiles show off their authority over them, and their high-ranking officials order them around. But that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be your slave. Just as the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. This is the word of the Lord. Today and the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the church, and uh, this is actually by request. I was talking to some folks around our church, and they, they said, what do you want to hear preached or taught about here in church? They said, could we learn more about the church? And so one of the ideas that came up out of that, uh, actually with our, some of our staff meetings, said, can we do a three-week series on First Free Methodist? So each week, this week, we're going to talk about First the, the, that part of our, our name. Next week, we're talking about free or free Methodism and what our, a little bit more about our denomination. A lot of people aren't familiar with our denomination, which is a global denomination and, and what it's about. And then the last week, we're going to focus on the Methodist part, which is our Wesleyan, uh, the Wesleyan movement that's going on around the, global, around the globe. And so we'll talk about this. So we'll start out here locally and kind of expand out over the next three weeks and learn a little bit more about the church. So today, I thought we'd start with 1880. Everybody remembers 1880, right? You all remember that? Were you all, anybody around in, eight, I didn't think so. So in 1880, the church, the first church in Seattle was started called First Free Methodist Church. It started on Pine Street downtown when a, a, a lay person named Hiram Pease called for a pastor from New York State and invited him to come all the way across the country to be the first pastor of what is now what is known as First Free Methodist Church. It was, uh, they built the church, and you saw a picture, you can see a picture, I think, on the screen here that they can bring up for you. This is the church building that existed on Pine Street. Right now, I think it's a construction site, but it claimed to hold 600 worshipers, and I, well, I guess the fire codes were a little different back then than they are today. So that's First Church, downtown Pine Street, 11 years later, in 1891, a second church was created here at this location called Second Church. Second Free Methodist Church was built here at this location, and uh, it was the second church. And that in in 1905, about uh, 14 years later, it it claimed to have 141 members here at this location. Now, you may be wondering what there's a first church, second church. In that time period, Denom- people, churches were known by their denominations, which we don't really focus on as much today. Uh, so the, the names aren't real creative, are they? Well, they were the first church. They were the second church. There's the third church. Philadelphia has a 10th Presbyterian church in Philadelphia. And so that's how they identify a church. They, that was the first group there. This was the second church. So interesting thing happened, though, in the life of this church, because it was down on Pine Street, and actually second church was here. And then the church at First Church on Pine Street decided to come and become a part of Second Church. And so all the people, they sold their building down on Pine Street, get this, for $26,000. How many people are like thinking, we should have held on to that property, right? How much is it worth today, right? We think that. But so there's a Second Church, a First Church moved here, and then four years later, they reported having about 250, 247 members, about 250 members, right? So that happened. They merged together, and, then, and they sold the church. And then something else happened. And if you read, I've been, I was reading out of the history. It's a history of the church that we keep here. And I was reading, and there's just one simple sentence in this book that struck me, kind of stuck out at me. And in 1924, this is, this is after they merged and after they, everybody from first church came to second church. And so 
up until 1924, this was called Second Free Methodist Church. And there's one little sentence in the history that says that in 1924, they changed the name of Second Church to First Church. Now, you may think, well, what's the big deal? Well, think about it. What was that board meeting like when they decided to change the name, right? Or think about, like, what was the, what were they debating? Like, what was the rationale or the reason that Second Church wanted to rename itself First Church, even though it was really Second Church, right? So I just want you to ponder that as we dig in a little bit deeper into what Jesus is teaching the disciples this morning. Because he's, what's happening here in chapter 20, which uh, Laurie read for us, is that what's happening is that uh, actually in chapter 19, the chapter before, Jesus tells his disciples, you all are going to rule with me on thrones in the new kingdom. So you guys are going to have, you're going to help me rule the new kingdom. So the disciples are hearing this and going, oh, we're going to get to be in charge. So it's very natural for a mother. So James and John, I think, was, were in kind of cahoots with their mother, and they probably came up with an agreement and say, Mom, will you go talk to Jesus, a rabbi? And it was very, very normal for a mother of sons to go make a request of a teacher, a rabbi. This was, this was not unfamiliar. So James and John kind of probably talked to their mom, and mom was kind of like talking to them, say, Let, let's go ask Jesus, right? So James, the mother, goes to Jesus and says, would you allow, of the 12 thrones, would you give my sons, James and John, the one on the right and the one on the left? And that significance of that is that one would be the, other that Jesus is like the king or the in, in charge. The person on the right was the first disciple, and the one on the left would be the second disciple. So they wanted to be first and second in the kingdom of the new kingdom of God, right? This is pretty human of us, right? I mean, we live in a culture where, you know, when we run a race, we don't run a race to be last, do we? We run to be first. We go to goal, we go to Olympics to win gold, we climb ladders to get to the top. And so part of our human condition, part of our human nature is to want to be first, to compete, and to want to be in charge and want to be in control, right? That's just part of who we are as human beings. Now, the other disciples, how, how do you think they responded to this request? What was it? If you heard the passage, what was their response? They weren't happy. They were, do you think they were jealous? Maybe envious? Or maybe they were like, hey, wait, we didn't get a chance to get our word in. What, what about us? Could we be first? Could we be second? Right? I can just see Jesus kind of pulling his hair out at this point, right? Because the thing is, is that he had just taught them another parable of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 20. And it's a parable about calling laborers to the vineyard and how the, the, the vineyard owner hires people in the morning and pays them the same amount that he hired people late in the afternoon and pays them the same. And so he pays them the same wage. And the people who were hired first were envious of the people that were hired last. So we see this envy kicking up again with the disciples. It's actually in chapter 20, verse 16, where we get that famous verse you've probably heard. So it says, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. Has anybody ever heard that before? The first shall be last, the last shall be first, right? So Jesus has just taught them about this, <laughs> just talked about this. And now they're asking, what are they asking? I want to be first. <laughs> I want to be second, right? Part of our humanity, right? So this, uh, this argument erupts. And so Jesus sits down the disciples, and here's what he teaches them. Let's just go back to those verses that we already heard. Verses 25, 27 says this. You know that those who rule the Gentiles show off their authority over them, and their high-ranking officials order them around, but that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be your slave. So, what does it mean then to be first church and not second church? It's a good question, right? What's going on, right? What is it about that? So I think about what are the historical roots of our church? What is in our DNA? And if you've noticed, there's something on the, the platform with me this morning, right? And it's actually a mission statement that was a part of our church. And I don't know if you, can everybody see that what's up on the platform? But it says, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister. That's part of the roots 
of this church to want to serve others, to, to not to be served, but to, to serve. And that's reflected in this mission, right? Our mission today is love people, connect them to Jesus, and serve the world, right? We're still in that role of serving others, of putting others above ourselves. This is part of Jesus' teaching and what it means to be a part of the kingdom, right? So we were talking uh, in our staff meeting this week and, uh, our, with our communications director, Philip, and Philip was asked, because we were talking about, hey, how do, you know, what are we communicating to the world around us, to our neighborhood, to our community, outside our church? And he, he asked a really great question. He said, well, do we see our church as a cruise ship, a battleship, or a mercy ship, like a medical ship? Like, which ship are we? Because that will tell us how we're going to communicate to the world around us, right? So we talked about that, and a cruise ship would be you know, like you, you come get on the, you, you get on the ship and you, you, everything's taken care of and you're comforted and taken care of and, you know, there's a buffet, you know. Uh, I, I, it just reminds me of the phrase people say, you know, well, why did you leave the church? Well, I just wasn't being fed. The, the buff, there was not the items on the buffet that I wanted, right? And so sometimes we use that analogy, right, even in church life, right? And so that's a cruise ship, right? That's a cruise ship uh, mentality. So they attract people, they comfort people, they take care of people, and they get them to beautiful destinations, right? At least people, I don't know if that's happening today as much, but you get it. Then there's the, the battleship, right? This image of the church where we're going to fight the good fight, we're going to fight the culture wars, we're going to attack the world, we're going to set the world straight, right? And we're going to do all this work to, to fight the culture. And that could be a battleship, right? And then there's the mercy ship, the the medical ship that says, hey, we're going to go to where the needs are, and we're going to meet the needs of people, and we're going to go help people who are in need and hurting and, har- and are hurt and trauma, and we're going to bring healing and hope to them. That's a mercy ship. So when you think about First Church, First Free Methodist Church, what ship comes to mind? What kind of ship are we? I thought it was a great question that we got to wrestle with. I'd let you ponder it. Does anybody here work for the cruise industry, by the way? I know we have got some folks that work at the cruise terminal. Anybody here from the cruise industry? I know in the early service we had some folks that work at the docks, and I asked them this question. When, when people's expectations aren't met on the cruise ship, what do they do? What do you, you can probably guess at this. What do they do? They complain, right? My expect, you, I didn't like what wasn't, it wasn't on the buffet, or this wasn't right, or that wasn't right. So their focus is on their comfort, on a cruise ship, right? And so they complain when their comfort is not met, right? When their preferences are not met or expectations are not met. You know, does anybody, has anybody ever known church people to do that? <laughs> right? So here's the thing I've learned, and I've been uh, in ministry for going on 29 years now, and I've served multiple churches. Here's the thing I've learned about church complaints. They're less when the church is focused on its mission. There's always going to, by the way, wherever there's people, there's going to be complaints. I mean, you don't have to be a pastor. You could be a teacher, right? You don't ever get complaints as teachers, do you? Never. Never, I didn't think so. Anybody else get a complaint? Everywhere we go where there are people, we get complaints. So that's just part of human humanity, right? But here's the thing I've learned. When the people in the church are focused on the mission, the complaints are reduced. I don't think they go away completely, but they're reduced because people are so focused on being a mercy ship and helping people in need and healing people and offering them hope, they don't have time. (laughs) Don't have time to complain because they're focused on the mission, not their preferences, not their comfort, but the how are we going to help others rather than be comforted ourselves? That's their focus. That's what Jesus is saying it means to be a disciple, right? So here are things as we think about our church, our local church, I would entitle three conversions for First Church. Three conversions. I use the word conversion because I think it's a little bit stronger. I thought about like, what are, maybe we just need to shift our mindset. No. Do we need to shift something? No. We need to actually convert these things. <laughs> Conversion means transformation, cha- overhaul, change, repentance, right? So conversion number one, all, and these all have to do with servanthood. The first one is take on the identity of a servant, that what would it look like for our church to take on this identity of servanthood? So one thing we could do, and not everybody liked this idea at the first service, is I said we could change our name. 
We could change our name from First Church to, well, let's say Last Church, for example. Have you ever seen a Last Church name? There's probably one out there somewhere, but Google it. Tell me later. But, you know, nobody says that. We, we, we're, we pride ourselves sometimes on being first, right? But that's, Jesus is saying, you really want to be great, you need to embrace this identity of servanthood, right? To being a servant. He actually uses the word in that particular translation, slave, right? So, if, at least if we're not going to change our name, which we'd have to reverse history from 1924, right? And maybe we call ourselves Second Church, like we really are, <laughs> That's what we are here. But what the other thing we could do is we could actually breathe new meaning into our name. What if first meant this is the place where we put God and others first? This is the place where we put people first and God first in our lives, not ourselves. That would be more servant-like, right? That would be, that would be a, a taking on that identity. Because I think the thing that we have to wrestle with as a church is are those of us already in the kingdom of God willing to set aside our needs and our preferences for those who have yet to come into the kingdom? Are we willing to do that? What does our name communicate to a person walking down Third Avenue who's never been here? What does first communicate to them? Probably not much. They probably don't even recognize it. But if they were to interpret that name, they'd probably interpret it in a cultural context of competition. Oh, that's, they, they think they're the first. They think they're the best. You know, I was in a leadership team meeting with uh, the late uh, Dr. David Dickerson, and David Dickerson was on our leadership team. He had been a part of this church for many years before he passed away. His wife, Betty, just recently passed away. And we were sitting in a leadership team meeting a couple years ago, and uh, we were talking about the pat, like the sh- ten, last 10 to 15 years of the church and the reasons that we wanted to help see the church turn around and, and become more missional in the community and in the neighborhoods. And we're having this discussion in our leadership meeting. And in the meeting, we kind of paused. And, and David had this way of just kind of like saying statements, you know. He was, you know, he's a professor, and he would just kind of throw out these phrases every once in a while that kind of made you go, hmm. And in the midst of this conversation, he says, you know, I, it, I think it's time we got over ourselves. That's what he said. I think it's time we as a church got over ourselves. Now, my interpretation of that was in the context and in that meeting was he was confessing that he had thought more highly of us than we ought to be thinking. He had thought we were better than we really were. Like, he thought we were this great, beautiful church and in reality, he was going, it was dawning on him that, you know, maybe we are thinking too highly of ourselves. And maybe part of the, what God is doing is God is humbling us to allow us to get back on mission. And I thought that was a beautiful moment, a beautiful confession for him, and it really was profound for me. And I thought, oh, this is good, right? We, we need to be humbled as a church. We're, we're, we may have been acting too long as a cruise ship, and it's time for us to get back to being a mercy ship. I think another conversion is that we need to embrace servanthood itself. Embrace it. Li- live it, right? And so that means shifting from meeting my needs and my comforts and what I want and my expectations to meeting the needs of others around us. So again, take that, that person, just the, the, the anonymous person walking by our church. What do they need? That person who has no understanding of God's love for them or that God wants to be a part of their life or maybe has emotional needs or spiritual needs or physical needs and they're walking by our church what do they need a servant if we embrace servant we're going to ask the question what do you need how can we help not hey take care of us or even like come in so you can help us meet our budget that's not what a servant church says right so that's the thing notice that Jesus, when Jesus came, Philippians chapter 2 describes Jesus coming, and we we just celebrated Christmas, but notice if you go to Philippians chapter 2, it says that he left heaven, so what's the greatest throne in the world that he could have? The throne in heaven. He had, he was with God, right? He left his throne. He left that place. He became human. Not only did he become human, what else did he do? He became a 
servant, it says. And not only did he become a servant, but he, became, he went to a cross. And when he went to the cross, what was his status, which was lower society, in a society, society, a class system, it was even lower than slave or servant. What was the status he had that took him even lower than that? Criminal. Just think about that. He's saying, I'm going to go one step lower than I'm asking you disciples to go. <laughs> now, there may be a day in the church where we are criminals. I don't know. In some countries, they are. But in this particular day, are we willing to take a step down? Notice that Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3 describes it this way. It says this, Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility... Think of others as better than yourselves. Instead, each of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. So if we were to humble ourselves and to think of others, think about that person walking by our church. Do what are we thinking? How are we thinking of them? Right? Are we looking to their needs spiritually, emotionally, physically? Are we on mission in that way, right? Are we embracing that? And then thirdly, the third thing is model servanthood. Like to model it as a church. And so that would actually mean that we would need to convert ourselves from an attractional model, right? <laughs> Where we, want, we think, oh, if we just make this a really great pray, place and we become a great church, and then, then we could attract people to us and then we could all just be happy together, right? We just need more people to come to us. That's what we think. That's attractional. What if we stop thinking that way and said, let's go out to where the needs are? Like, a cruise ship wants to attract people right now to it. It wants to get passengers on board, right? That's what a cruise industry is doing right now. They say, how can we get people to take cruises? (laughs) We'll lower the price. We'll offer better food. We'll put water slides on the deck. You know, they're thinking all these things to attract people to them. But a mercy ship doesn't do that. There are no water slides on a mercy ship. There's no buffet dinner on a mercy ship. The mercy ship, the medical ship, is going to then sail and leave and go to where the need is in the world. Disciples aren't about attracting. Churches aren't to be attractional. They're to be sending disciples that go and make other disciples. That's actually the mission of Jesus. And so what we're to be doing as a church is actually sending people into the neighborhoods, sending people in the community to be the hands and feet of Jesus in those neighborhoods. That's why we do prayer walks. We pray and walk through a neighborhood and say, God, what are the needs here? Because we get to see those needs with our own eyes. And we say, God, what are you asking us to do in this neighborhood? And then we're looking for leaders, for disciples who will look into their neighborhood and say, I will take the lead here on behalf of the kingdom of God, on behalf of the church, and I will take the lead here. And we as a church will come behind you with resources and encouragement and equip you to do those things that God is calling you to do in the neighborhood. We've made a commitment to do that because we want to model it. You know, Heather and I went to dinner the other night. We braved the, the COVID storm of Omicron. And we went out to grab our pizza, Friday night pizza night. And I noticed something. There were people there to serve us called waiters and waitresses. And we sat down at a table. And they never expected us to get up from the table and come to them. They all came to us. They came to where we were. They asked how they could serve us. They asked what they could do for us. Now, I didn't need pizza, by the way. As you can tell, I don't need more pizza. But I wanted pizza. But notice that they came, the point is that they were willing to come to where we were. They didn't expect us to go to them, right? That's the difference. I always think of what E. Stanley Jones said that the church is simply a missional outpost of the kingdom of God. That's what we are, a missional outpost. And the thinking there is this, like what would it look like for us as a church to be a place where we were out in mission, we were disciples, we were being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, and then we came together here in worship to share stories of what God was doing as in our discipleship. 
Like we just came and said, hey, this is where I see God working. Here's what happened. Or, ooh, this really, I really failed this week as a disciple. I mean, I could come and confess and get encouragement and have people kind of say, you know, God's grace is good. We, we you know, keep trying. Don't give up, right? Like, you know, my, my neighbor doesn't like me because I'm a Christian. That's a, that's a common theme here. And so what would that look like to encourage each other to be on mission? and to be in the mission field, right? So we came together here as missionaries, so to speak, and encouraged each other. If a, that's what a mission, missionaries do. They come together and they encourage one another, and they talk to one another. It's also a place of confession where we can express and confess that we failed. Like, oh, I messed up this week. You know, I told off my, my neighbor because the didn't like what he, what he did or this or you know same you know you ever like want to represent Jesus in the world and then you feel like you know I messed up <laughs> I do that often I could have could have done better there I need to confess that I could have done better I could have done something different there right that's okay that's a good thing and then when we come and confess to one another we actually heal each other and we reset our souls to the kingdom right that's what I think the church could be so what do you think what do you think? Here's some questions for reflection, and then we'll pray. So here's some reflection questions for those of you joining us online or those of you getting ready to go to a group after this service. So number one, what do you think is the role of the church in our city, in this city or our city? So what do you think? I mean, we've talked a little bit about this, but what are your thoughts on that? Number two, what would it take to transform a cruise ship into a mercy ship? So think about that metaphor and say, what would you have to do to the ship? What would you change on the ship that was a cruise ship to make it into a mercy ship? What would you do differently? What would, and that's more than rearranging the deck chairs, by the way. Number three, what does it look like to be a servant to others for you? What actions would exemplify this attitude? And then number four, what ways could first free embrace the kingdom mission of Jesus? I'd love for you guys to talk about it in your group or at home. Just talk about what that would look like for the church. So hopefully this has been also just a good reminder that our our mission is to love people, connect them to Jesus, and serve the world. It's still similar mindset to, to be out in the world. So let's pray together. God, thank you for gathering us together here today. May this be a place of encouragement. May this be a place of confession. May this be a place of challenge to grow in our discipleship and to follow you, that we're all just trying to be like Jesus. And we need each other. We need the community to help with that. We need your faithfulness, God. And thank you for the encouragement at this table of grace here today, this communion table, which reminds us that you offer us grace when we confess. When we confess to you, those things we become aware of in our lives that are those dark side, that shadow side, the sin side of our lives, we know that we can come to you and confess those sins to you and confess the darkness to you, and you offer us hope and grace and forgiveness. And this table reminds us of that. So Lord, in a moment, we just take a moment and we pause. And in our own spirits, we pray and we confess whatever it is that you put on our heart this morning whatever is getting in the way of our relationship with you, whatever is getting in the way of your mission and your kingdom and us serving you, Lord, would you speak to us and help us to confess those places in the quietness of our hearts. God, thank you that you forgive us our sins and our brokenness and our flaws and our mistakes and that you call us to embrace servanthood, to think of others, to humble ourselves. And so we come humbly to this table this morning, humbly to receive your grace poured out for us in bread and cup. And we pray, God, that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and pour out your Holy Spirit on this cup and this bread as we break it together and as we join together in this communion. Lord, would you pour your Spirit out on your church because we know that it starts with us. So, Lord, would you come be among us at this table as we celebrate your grace and love for us today. And we pray that prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.